Welcome to Seaside Sermons, a ministry of ChristAssembly.org. My name is Bert Allen. You know, most people are kind of lousy at friendships. Have you ever noticed that? And maybe you're one of those people who's kind of lousy at friendships, too. And what makes us lousy at friendships? We're lousy at friendships when we're not loyal, dependable, faithful, you know, and looking out for the best interest of our friend. And when you get down to that, think about if you're really a friend of God or not. Are you really interested in doing what he wants and putting his interest and his love in your life first? Are you willing to do what he wants you to do? And a lot of people say, yeah, 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 I really want to do that. But they have some areas in their life where they really aren't quite so friendly with God. And in Second Thessal- 1 Thessalonians, and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul kind of addressed that, that y'all are doing really well. Your faith is abounding. People all over have heard the gospel through y'all. Y'all at Thessalonica are just doing a great job, and you need to excel still more. And then he brings up immorality, and you go, wait a second. Why would he be talking about immorality with people who are strong Christians and doing well? Why bring up immorality with them? Well, you know, he's writing under the inspiration of God, and God's telling him every word. He's breathing out the words for Paul to write down. So as Paul is writing them down, we're thinking, so why did you suddenly bring up immorality? That God said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, he said, abstain from immorality. And then in verse 4, here's what he says. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 4. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. And that tells me right off the bat that even the strongest of Christians need to be aware of possessing their own vessels in sanctification and honor. In other words, avoid immorality. Don't do things with your body that will displease God and create real problems in the friendship between you and God, but it will also create real problems in any other relationships you have. When you dive into immorality, think about this. You're always going to do the immorality with somebody else. If you're not having sex with your spouse that God provided, and that's always one male with one female that God's joined together in marriage. If you're having sex outside of marriage, any kind of sex with any one male or female, no matter what you're doing sexually, God's going to call that immorality if you're doing it with somebody other than your wife. And you go, wow, okay. So God says that is a problem that all believers will face, even those like the people at Thessalonica that are doing well generally. They are great friends to one another. They are a friend of God, and things are going really well spiritually. And then that immorality pops up. You know, in our lives, we've got areas that are much harder to deal with than others, and immorality is one of those areas. You know, if you talk to people, you'll see that a lot of folks have problems with immorality that are believers. They can be living with somebody they're not married to. They can even have kids with somebody they're not married to. They can be living with somebody else and thinking, well, this is okay. We just don't really want that marriage certificate. We don't want the legal entanglements. But we're fully in love with each other and committed to each other. And God says, that's still immorality. I didn't marry you. You haven't been joined by God in marriage. Okay, well, um, I'm not really doing intercourse with somebody. That, uh, that's still immorality if you're doing sexual stuff with them. Well, I'm not even doing anything physical. I'm just thinking about it. And God says, did you not read what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount? Remember, Jesus is God. And he said, if you just look on a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So even if your mind, that's where pornography comes up. If you've got problems with pornography and you're looking at that and thinking about that, you're squarely in immorality again. So no matter where on the scale of immorality you're at, it's still a problem even for the strongest of believers. That's why he's writing this here. And it destroys friendships. You know, we have this there's a saying out there on the internet that you can move out of the friend zone, meaning that you can be something more than friends. And depending on what that means in your particular situation, if you're moving beyond the friend zone into immorality, that's always going to be a problem if you're not married to that person. If you're becoming romantically involved with somebody 
but you're married to a spouse and you're becoming romantically involved with somebody else, that's a problem that's going to lead to immorality. Where's all this going? Here's what God wants. Back to verse 4. God says, you can know how to possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor. And let's go back to sanctification. Sanctification happens immediately the moment you're born again. And God says, now I've declared you righteous as a judicial proceeding. I've taken my son's payment of your death penalty. That's off the table. You've gained all of his righteousness, so you're holy and blameless and completely sanctified at the moment of salvation. But that's just one kind of salvation, sanctification. And I'm going to call that salvation, sanctification. It happens instantly. But then we live our lives, and we still sin. And God says there's also a process of sanctification that takes place during your lifetime. Jesus prayed to sanctify the believers in the Word of God, and Jesus said that's the Word of God that sanctifies us. So there's this ongoing process of making us holy and set apart for God's use. That's at the root of the idea of sanctification, to make holy, set apart for God's use. Then there's that final sanctification that comes when we die, go to heaven, and see Jesus face to face, and we live with him forever. We are completely, totally sanctified in that sense. No more sin. So he's talking about that living sanctification right here where he says, you can know that. But notice that. You have to know. God's got to instruct you and show you how to avoid using your vessel for immorality, that you use it for sanctification and honor. So if we think about that, it is dishonorable to fall into immorality. It is a blow to our sanctification when we fall into immorality. But the great part is you can know how to use your body, your physical body, You can learn how to do that so that you glorify God with your body because you know how to possess your vessel, that would be your body, and you know how to do that in sanctification and honoring to God. He gave you this body as a free gift. He says, now use your vessel, your body, because it's a vessel that contains the Holy Spirit who came into your life and indwells you permanently at the moment of salvation. Boom know how to do that because when you fall into immorality you grieve the holy spirit who takes up permanent residence in your vessel your body remember we are sealed for the day of redemption we've been sealed with the holy spirit the holy spirit remains with us always remember god's three persons but one god father son holy spirit well let's wind up So what does it mean to be a great friend in Christ and how do we do that? It means we know how to possess our vessels in sanctification and honor so that we we do not fall into immorality. If we do, we confess our sins and God will cleanse us and we can be sanctified and we can go back to honoring God with our bodies. It's never too late to stop the immorality by the power of God. He'll always love you. He'll always help you. But knowing that you can avoid that, you don't have to fall into it, the temptation will never be so great that you have to give in to immorality. God says he's faithful. He'll always provide a way of escape. You'll never just have to fall. So let's pray and thank God. Lord, we thank you that you teach us how to avoid immorality, that we can use our bodies for sanctification and honor to your glory every day. We pray, Lord, that we would follow your ways and love you more. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Before I close the video, I'd like to share with you four verses about eternal life. I often ask people this simple question. Why should Jesus let you into heaven? And the answer to that question surprises many people because it comes from the Bible and it's simple and it's clear. Most folks, when they hear that question, they tell me, well, I've been good, or tried to do more good than bad, or I tried hard, or I've done a lot of nice things, and I hope God will let me into heaven. They somehow think if their good works outweigh their bad works, that God will let them in. But God says, actually, I'll let people into heaven because of a free gift. But the story from Jesus starts with four verses, and I'm going to read them one at a time. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
Romans 3.23. You see, for every person who lives today on earth in human flesh, we've all sinned, every one of us. We've all told a lie. We've all done or said something that made somebody else angry, and we were doing it out of anger ourselves. We've all done things to hurt other people at one time or another. God says that's all sin, and I look upon that as falling short of my glory, God says. God says we should never fall short of his standard, which is the glory of God. Well, is it serious that we've sinned? Should I be worried about that? Everybody sinned. Why should I worry? Well, consider Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, that all of us deserve the death penalty. At the moment we sinned, we incurred the death penalty for the smallest sin or the biggest sin. I'm happy that Romans 3.26.23 continues and says, But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, if you've been listening carefully and thinking about what the Bible says, so far we've learned that we're all sinners, we all fall short of the glory of God, and we all deserve the death penalty. This doesn't sound like good news until you read the last part of that last verse. It says that God has a free gift for all of us. It's in Christ Jesus our Lord, and it's eternal life. The free gift of eternal life that only Jesus Christ can give you. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Why would God offer us this great gift if we're all sinners? Well, Romans 5, 8 tells us. It says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. He died in our place. God loves sinners like you and like me. He died in my place and in your place. He paid the death penalty for me. I often illustrate the free gift like this. That I have this old Nissan truck. It has 285,000 miles on it. It's not that great a truck. It sits at the beach every day. But I illustrate the point this way. I hold up the keys to my truck and I say, I'm going to make you a symbolic gift of my truck. But until you take the keys out of my hand, it's not your truck yet. Well, let me tell you what I mean. A lot of people have been going to church for years. They know all about Jesus. They can quote verses about Jesus. But they know in their heart that they're not quite right with God. And there's never been a day in their life where they've been born again and they know it. You see, they're just staring at the keys in God's hand and he's offering you the free gift today of saying, reach out by faith and receive that free gift and take it into your heart today. Receive the free gift. Okay, how do we do that? Well, Romans 10.9 tells us how to do that. It says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he means saved from the death penalty, eternal destruction. So we can receive that free gift right now by faith, and we can pray a prayer together. I urge you to pray with me. I'm going to pray it right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I confess that I am a sinner and I fall short of the glory of God. I confess, too, that I deserve the wages of sin, which is death. But, Lord, you offer me the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I accept that free gift right now. I believe that you love me and that God died on the cross for me that Jesus Christ is God, and he died on the cross for me. You paid the death penalty for me, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I repent of my sins, and I accept that free gift, Lord. Thank you so much that you have forgiven me. In your name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I'd love you to send me an email and we'll rejoice together. Send me the email at friend 
at ChristAssembly.org. That's friend at ChristAssembly.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Hallelujah. Scripture quotations taken from the NASB, New American Standard Bible, copyright 1995 by the Lockman Foundation. Used by permission, all rights reserved.